five. I'm sweating, and you over there with my jacket on. That's crazy. Uh, one of the things when you go through difficult times in life is that you, you have to learn as a believer to turn to the book. The book is the only place with life in it. And, and last week, I talked to you about being hungry after God. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after right things, for they will be filled. Righteousness. Well, this week I went back to it because for me, uh, I, I did not know where to turn. I didn't know what to do, and, and, and I felt so inadequate. Um, I, I preached my dad's funeral. And, uh, you know, I, that night before the funeral, I, I, I laid there in bed. And it's funny how, you know, doing somebody else's is one thing. Doing your dad's is another. And I, and I have these memories, and I'm writing all these memories down of my pop. And then I go to my mom, and I make sure that, I'm, that this is really what happened. You know, <laughs> one, one instance is I remember my dad got mad at a horse and kicked it. And the horse kicked him back. And he had a big old U-shaped tattoo on his chest. I looked at mom. I said, now, mom, is this the way I remember? She said, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Went, oh, good. Because I didn't want to get up and tell stuff that, that was in a dream that it really wasn't my pop, you know. And so I had these long list of things I wrote down. And some things I, and smart, I left out. There are things about my daddy ain't none of your business. Amen. Amen. I will always keep those covered and they'll go to the grave with me. And uh, I just think that's the way it should be. But, but there were things that made him my pop, you know, and who he was and to, to his, uh, his grandsons. And I was thankful to have my boys there to Paul Bear and uh, my daughter. She, she couldn't make it, neither could uh, Katie or Jill. But they, they still, my mom knows that they were loved there. So I turned to the book. And I read to you again out of Matthew chapter 5 where he says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, I, I didn't say this last Tuesday, I did on Wednesday night, when he saw the multitudes. W the crowds that came to Christ all had different problems. And when he begins to lay out the Beatitudes, he's going to lay out different attitudes for so many specific people. When, when I come to church, one of the things, and, and then I would tell Joseph and David, any other preacher this who ministers the Word of God, be careful not to hone in on one person's problem. Realize that there is a multitude of people out there that are going through a multitude of financial, relational, physical needs, and you just got to cast the word out there and let the word fall on them and deal with them. Because many times, and that's why I, I have this uh, uh, principle that I will not talk with people before church. I'll say hi to you, but I don't want to hear your problem before church. Amen. Because if I do, guess what? Somehow it might filter out, and then you'll think I'm picking at you or going after you. It's, it's better. I love to hear this, these messages from people. He read my mail. I can't believe he knew everything I was going through. Uh, my my uh, son-in-law's brother showed up to church in, uh, a couple weeks ago, and God got hold of him, and he was like, I can't believe that. He, everything I was going through, he was just right down the line talking about, he was talking to me. Did you tell him, Johnny? Johnny said, I ain't talk to, talk to him about you. you know, and, then, and then, of course, the, the next, next week was the same thing with another relative. So I love the Word of God for that. So allow me to be me, and, you know, and I don't mind talking to you about things, but let the Word fall where it is. So the multitude, you can imagine the multitude, man. They came, they were hungry. Multitudes got around Jesus. They, they came to hear the word, but a lot of them came with diseases. They came with problems. Their, their food sustenance was day to day. Many of you, uh, you got food stored up for months. Some of you got generators and gasoline off to the side. You've been waiting on the zombie apocalypse. You know something's fixing to happen. And now them clowns are a precursor to the zombies. You know something's fixing to give here in America. And, and, and who knows who gets elected or what this thing's going to turn out. And so you're storing up sardines and biscuits and things of that nature. And, and you've got, you know. But these, the, the people that Jesus dealt with had one day. They lived day by day. Every day, they, they went out and they fished for their food. And, and, and if they were sitting hunting or they made bread, and sometimes they just had bread or they had lentils, they, they, they had a very, uh, uh, their existence was just, again, day by day. That's why the scripture when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread many of us we're, we're stored up on the gospel man we got it on cds and mp3s and we we, we got our favorite preachers and we just punch a, a button on our computer and boom our favorite preachers giving us the the snack for today you know and what we need to hear and we we can just run through it and we're all good but it's every day we need the word of god so i'm, I'm almost nervous about thinking that we're so stockpiled that we don't go back to the word when we need it and so every day, they, 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 so here they come, they, they show up with Jesus, a multitude, they're there with him. And he sits down and he begins to speak to them and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And, you know, I could go on, blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. I believe that. Mourning is, is, is it's okay. Tears are their language understood by everyone. But there's something about this one scripture here where he says, and he opened his mouth and he taught them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, when I studied through the Beatitudes, I realized a lot of people don't even know what poor in spirit was, and neither did I until I began to study it. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Uh, you know, God's not a God of poverty. God's a God of plenty. He's a God of tremendous provision. So what's this poor in spirit all about? All about The impact of the Beatitudes is literally like spiritual torpedoes. They, these are among the first words Jesus spoke to the disciples that would turn everything they knew upside down. Words such as poor, mournful, hungry, persecuted. This is the lot for a disciple uh you know you almost want to unlist from this thing you got saved last sunday and you want to backside and get out of this today because this thing's gonna be rough because it's poor it's persecuted you know i know we're going to have a happy life i can go to the bookstores and see books that say have a happy life by such and such author god made you to bless you I, i believe all that but i also believe the other side that there's persecution in this life that there's going to be some hard times there's going to be times the commode ain't going to work hello and that's simple stuff, man. That's easy. But, but then I think what's going on in Syria, and I think about what's going on in, in, uh, uh, in the Middle East where they're persecuting believers and they're, they're, they're getting their, their, their lives taken from them or they're being burnt. Some of them are actually choosing. Uh, I read one story where one young lady caught herself on fire. As a believer in Christ, she set herself on fire because she was tired of being raped by the ISIS soldiers. And she thought if they would look at her differently, they would leave her alone. And, she, and they did. After she disfigured herself, they left her alone. But I think of the persecution they're going through, and we're over here complaining about gas maybe getting close to 250 a gallon again. You know, God, give us a different perspective. Amen? Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Thus begins our training. At Luke 640, Jesus said, Everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Jesus is the embodiment of the Beatitudes. And by the power and the persistence of the Holy Spirit, we too will become like that. Listen, guys, you, when you walk through the Beatitudes and you see the mourning, the persecution, and the uh, hunger after right, these were all Jesus' attitudes. He's showing you this is my attitude. If there's anything you want your kids to pick up from is a good attitude that you got. Amen. If you've got a good attitude, I hope they pick up the attitude. It's attitude. Attitude it, it shifts to everything. Attitude tells, you know, I, I, again, I'm a big sports watcher, and I watch attitude. Athletics is one thing, but when you get the right attitude that goes with it, it can shift the whole team. I, I can, I, you see the whole thing begin to shift because the attitude is that we can win. We can do this thing. So I start off with the prosperity here of the poor. And, yes, that's not a misnomer. The prosperity, the, the richness of being poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven in a nutshell it's three things first contentment this is it contentment blessed blessed are the poor blessed it's an inward condition not an outward circumstance it doesn't mean that the water may not be running things may be going sour but on the inside i still feel blessed everybody say i'm blessed come on say it like you mean it Amen. See, it doesn't depend on what I see. The second is the confession. They confess, I'm poor in spirit. It's an acknowledgement of a moral bankruptcy with God. In other words, without God, I can do nothing. Morally, I am bankrupt. Without him, you know, guys, I can tell you, and, and let me just uh, um, lay this out. No matter how bad you think you've been, the world in right now is worse. No matter how bad you've thought, in the, in the, the, maybe the lust, the, the greed, the envy, uh, all the, those things that have run through your mind, you say, man, I've just been bad. It's, it's, just, it's just been bad. It, the world is worse. You, you and I are nothing without God. I think when it was sin that introduced me to grace. Not that I thank God for sin. But it was sin that said to me, you need grace. It was sin that said, you got a problem. It was sin that said, you, you, need, you need to get control of that. Sin, in, in other words, worked for my good and not for my bad. Amen. It brought me back to the knees of the Father. So confession, poor in the Spirit, acknowledge moral bankruptcy. And then the citizenship. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, in this nation, we're big about citizenship, aren't we? Oh, yeah. If you come into this nation without being a citizen, they, some of us will get redneck. You know, I wonder if in heaven, if there's going to be, uh, well, evidently, you're going to have to be a citizen to get in. Can I get an amen? 
You're not going to be able to sneak in across the border or jump a fence or go over a wall. You're going to have to be a citizen of the Most High. You've got to be stamped and covered with the blood of Jesus. Amen. You've got to be a believer in Christ and acknowledge the fact that you're nothing without Him. You, 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 literally, you are nothing. you've got to have Him. I can't breathe. I can't talk. I can't walk. I can't move my hands without Him. Everything I do is because I live and I move and I have my being. Why? Because of Him. Amen. He, he lives inside of me. So accepting Jesus' teaching requires two things and this is the poverty of the self-sufficient and by the way we are those that go from rags to riches and we we confess our rags we confess the fact that we are nothing without him first acknowledging our impoverished condition you know you can't be helped without acknowledging it that's why we ask on Sundays and other times do you know that you uh, and be honest do you know you're a sinner do you know that you're without Christ do you know you're without hope until you acknowledge the fact that that you have drugs alcohol uh, other disorders in your life you can't get no help amen you have to get to a place in your life where you say now I'm not saying that it means you drink a beer or, 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 or something like that I'm not doing that I'm telling you you know that it owns you that's the honesty here it owns you, man. It owns you. Uh, I, was, I was with my brother, and he was having a little party out in his man cave during the Alabama game, and uh, he, I wasn't invited. <clears throat> I invite myself. I have never waited on an invitation from anyone to go anywhere. I don't need it. I'm me. I mean, I just show up. So I, I walked into the room, and it was like, my brother had his, he was chatty. My brother, he, he don't chat. He don't, they don't talk, but he was chatty when I walked in. That means something was happening when I walked in. And they watched the game. And all of a sudden, this guy I did not know looks at me and he says, hey, man, you want a beer? Well, he didn't know me. And, uh, and he lifted up that cooler, and there was a long neck light, Miller light. And I said, yeah. And, and while, I was, while I was reaching for it, my brother said, my brother don't drink. And I said, thank you. And I grabbed that beer. And I said, uh, I want it. It'll be in the refrigerator in the house when y'all come in. But I do want it. But I ain't going to drink it. <laughs> so if you need it, it'll be in the fridge. But I want to thank you for offering me one because I do want it. And I ran in the house with it. And everybody saw me with a long neck in my hand. And I put it. In other words, what, what would have been the difference of me preaching to him at that moment? You know, and really kind of slamming them for drinking. It, it, that just made them upset. But when I did that, my brother told me the next day, he said, that's the funniest thing, boy, I've ever seen when you took that beer and run out of that room. You know, because uh, here, tell the truth. Do you want a beer? Well, absolutely. Pfft, loved it. Enjoyed it. And I know some of you. You want a wine cooler? <laughs> Why, Sure. You know, I'm not, I don't even go to, go to the weed here because that really messed some of y'all up because y'all trying to keep a straight face. <laughs> Here's the deal. I can't get help until I acknowledge I need help. I've got to tell God I need help. I can't do this on my own. I, can't, I, can't, I, cannot, I cannot do my sister's funeral, my dad's funeral one month on my own. I can't do that. I can't stand in front of people who love me the way they do, and look behind me, and there is the, the remains of someone I love. I can't do this. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I, I think of the scriptures, and it, and it goes through my mind. See, we often don't notice our spiritual need because of our God-given abilities. I, I know I'm charismatic. That, that doesn't bother me. It's who I am. I, don't, I, don't, I hear people put it, oh, that's just a church with a charismatic pastor. Well, now I've got two charismatic youth pastors. You know? So uh, the, here's the thing. I understand that. I, I have a God-given ability. But, you know, and, and God's blessed me. But these gifts came from God. Yeah. And uh, you've got to understand and acknowledge that. But we've got to see our poverty before God. H here's the deal. All you've got to do is compare your stuff with his stuff. Compare your attitude with his attitude. Compare your sins with his. How's that working? Huh? Uh, bottom line is we're poor we are spiritually deficient without him 1 Corinthians 4 7 says what makes you better than anyone else what do you have that God hasn't given you and if all you have is from God why boast as though you have accomplished something on your own wow why <laughs> you, you like you I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps well yeah but God gave you the straps and the hands to pull with 
Hello? It is an acknowledgement of who he is. So blessed are the poor, poor. It means coming up short and knowing it. It, it, it that, that is what it means to be poor, and that's what God wants us to see. I have, I am, nothing. I, I was sitting on the porch at the house in Alabama, and I looked down, and my cousin Tony came in. And by the way, it was good to see him and let him acknowledge the fact that it was him that got me in trouble when I was a little feller. <laughs> And he did admit to it, finally. Yeah, you know, he's the one that got me standing up in the back of the truck, and my dad saw me walking on in the truck, you know, standing up, and he whooped my rear end for it. It didn't matter how many times I told him, but Tony told me to. I was probably eight or nine years old then. And then I was five or six years old, and I snuck home from a, a, a cotton patch with, uh, at 12 o'clock instead of letting my granny know about it. It was Tony that taught me in this stinking home. He was four years older than me. I had a long talk with him while he was there in Alabama because... <laughs> my, my backside was hurt because of this guy. Everybody's got a cuz in your life. I did something to you, got you in trouble, got you to do something. You, thank God there were no camera phones in. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. So, I, 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 but I'm looking down and I remember my granny's house and, I, and we started talking about what we didn't have as kids and how God has blessed us as we've gotten older. And we realize that everything that we've got has come from God. That is blessed is the poor in spirit. That's, that's when you acknowledge the fact God without you. Now, it doesn't mean you beat yourself down. It means that there's an acknowledgement there. You have to see your poverty against his plenty. It, it seems God delights to bring us to the end of ourselves, to expose our deficiency, that his sufficiency, sufficiency might show forth. You know, it's when you hit the bottom that you realize how much you really need God. You know, when half a country roamed about a hillside hungry, the disciples brought the problem to Jesus. I say, if you've got problems, bring them to Jesus. Luke chapter 9, verse 12 says, Late in the afternoon... The twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. He replied, y you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all of this crowd, about 5,000 men were there, which means you go the, the women and children, you're looking at at least 15,000 people. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 the disciples did so, and everybody sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to his disciples. He set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Uh, Jesus, the scenario was simple. Jesus said to the disciples, you feed them. The disciples said, it's impossible. We only have five tortillas and two sardines. Jesus said, now, now you're talking. What's he saying? We're insufficient. We, we have a deficit. There's no way we can make this work. Sometimes I look at uh, the, the finances of our church. I go, there's no way we're going to make this work. It's just ain't going to work out. But, but God always has a way. And he tells the disciples, now you feed them. It wasn't until the disciples saw their limited resources were what they really were did Jesus go into the fish and chips business. They all ate, the Bible said, and were satisfied. Just like Jesus, not only the impossible and all you can eat, man, all you can eat. And again, guys, not to be redundant here, but to understand that we are all involved in the miracles that take place in this church. It ain't a, it ain't a big I and a little you. It's everybody together here. And so he he set them in companies of 50 and 100, uh, one scripture used uh, and 100, which simply says that God is a God of order. You can't take care of people in chaos. Right, you got to have order. You know, that's why uh, you, I don't like drinks in the sanctuary. I don't like uh, eating in the sanctuary. A bottle of water doesn't bother me. But, but the bottom line is there has to be a sense of, because you, you don't know where this is ever going to stop. So there has to be a, a sense of order. He set them down to 50s and 100. And then he gave the disciples the bread. And he, he looked up toward heaven. What's he saying? Uh, th there's nothing down here I can make happen without you, God. So here we go. He blessed the bread and the fish. And he hands it to the disciples. Now, if you've got a group of 50 people, well, th that bread probably went straight over to the 50, that first 50. And, and so they tore the bread, and they, and they gave it to this guy on the end, and he tore it, and they kept on going down the line. And they snapped the fish, and they handed a tail to one and a head to the other. And they snapped the fish, and they, hand, they had a, a head in one hand and a tail in the other, and they pass it down. And as they're going down, by the time it came back over, well, they, well, hang on. I thought we just sent it down. And they come back, and now we still got a basket full. So they go over to this 50, and they, they get. I wonder during the scenario when they realized they were walking in the miracle here. 
Amen. As they're watching, can you see their eyes getting big as, as they snapped a head and the head grew a tail and the tail grew a head and they snapped a head and the head grew a tail and the tail grew a head and he passed it down. He said, you try it. And he snapped it and he went, look at that. Whoa. It was snap, 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 like snapping peas, man. And they went all the way around and they tore the bread. They went around and, and Peter looks over at John and says, are you catching this? I'm seeing it. And Jesus just sitting up there and then, and, and then you know, there's Sid and, and Festus and, and Marjorie and, 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 and Wilma and they're all getting in and they're tearing the bread. And the, and the fish, and it's going around the room. And next thing you know, they went from 50 to 100 to 300 to 1,000. Now it's moved into 5,000. And how's the bread? Still good. Amen. And 15,000 men are fed. And then the women and the daddies are snapping the fish and giving it to the kids. The kids are grinning and snapping, snap, 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 snap. Quit snapping so much, man. And when they, when they snap, it, then, then the Bible says they picked up everything that was left over. God is a God of leftovers. He loves left. I'll preach that to you someday. Amen. He's something about God loves the leftovers. Your mother loved less leftovers. They were known as casseroles. <laughs> huh? Amen. He said, whatever's left over, you throw it together and make a casserole out of that. And I found out a long time in life that that was a fancy word for leftovers. I thought, well, hey, we're having casserole. Yeah, have casserole tonight. Mom, it resembles something we had the last three nights. Just eat it, boy. But all the fish and all the bread, and then they go around and they pick it up. And you can imagine after, guys, we, we fed masses of people. You know, it takes a while. You know, the biggest gripe we can often get is when the workers say, well, why ain't eight yet? Why ain't eight yet? Well, bless your heart. You know, neither have I, because I'm going to tell you, I will go the whole day without eating to make sure that you understand it ain't about me. Right. Amen. Amen. So we, we go all day, ain't eating, and then, then by the end, here, here, and then gather up, not nine, not ten, not eleven, well, hang on. Why not just get 11? Because we know Judas is a thief, don't we? Right. Let's don't feed the crook. 12. 12 basketfuls were there. Now, the next scenario goes like this. They get into a boat. They go across the water. And the Bible says a storm comes up, and they begin screaming for help. You just got to read your Bible. Your Bible's full of fun stuff. And the Scripture says that here's the question. Where were the 12 baskets? They were in the boat. The miracle is there, but they've forgotten. Here's our problem. We often forget yesterday's miracles, and it brings out today's frustrations. He's the same God that took care of stuff then. He's going to take care of stuff now. Twelve, and, he, and the thing was that nothing would remain. So you had all the leftovers taken care of. God, God loves, he likes all that leftover stuff you got. Amen. And, I, and he's not a hoarder, but he's not wasteful either. Amen. So I love it. 12, 12. Perfect. Perfect. When the pressure of impossibilities rest on you, what are you going to do? That's literally what Jesus said. You feed them. Hang on. This is impossible. It's impossible to feed. And by the way, we got the lunch. We got the, the, the fish and the sardine, uh, the, the, the sardines and the, and the tortillas from a little boy. Right? So what you got is, and it was Andrew. Let's just go ahead and magnify the story here. It was Andrew that brought the, the bread to Jesus, brought the boy to Jesus. Every time Andrew's in the Bible, he's a great evangelist. He's always bringing somebody to Jesus. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Andrew brought uh, the Greeks to Jesus. Andrew brings the boy to Jesus. And, and then and here, to me, that is the miracle. The miracle is not so much the fish and the bread. The miracle is talking a little boy out of his sack lunch. <laughs> Try that one sometime, man. Them little boys, they not let go of their lunches. But he talked that little boy out of it, and he gave that lunch up, and now they got the miracles working, great things are happening. But it rests on it. Jesus said, you feed them. Isaiah 30, verse 18 says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Your impossible situation may be a, a heart that needs mending, a terrible habit that has you bound, a physical miracle, financial, a mental a spiritual breakthrough in your life, you got to take your hands off of things and ask God in absolute faith to take over. Because you, you, you're, you're bankrupt, my friend. Spiritually, you can't do this thing. You cannot make the bread the fish go that far. You can't make your finances go that far. You can't make your emotions stretch over the foolishness and the chaos of other people. Amen. So you have to say, God, take over. You take over this situation. I'm, I'm poor in spirit. By the way, I'm a citizen. Do you know what it means to be a citizen of heaven? How about you're a citizen of, the, of America? When you go to another country, your chest is out. 
I've been in other countries, and I, I throw the badge around in a heartbeat. American. That's what I am. Now listen to me preach, and I'll just tear it up, man, because I'm from America. Not only from America, I live in Texas. Now that upped me one right there. Hey, man, there's one thing coming from Alabama, but now I live in Texas. And so yeah, I remember going to England after 9-11. I was wearing my, do you all know what a McLeod jacket looks like? I had a western jacket with, fl with fringe on it, you know. And I wore that because I couldn't fly everything over, so I just found the thing that I was most comfortable with. And it was kind of winter over there as it was kind of summer over here. So I went over there and I preached with my boots on. I had my, my alligator boots on. And, I, and it, to me, it was normal. It looked like I was here. But over there, <laughs> I stuck out a little bit. But I was proud to tell him English folk over there that I was American. And had they watched The Patriot. <laughs> Why? Because I'm a citizen. Of this, and I got this crazy idea. Had anything happened to me over there, somebody over here is going to come rescue me. If I needed money, somebody going to send it. If I needed help, somebody going to get over there and take care of me. Felt the same way in Jamaica. Felt the same way in, in South Africa. I felt the same way in Mexico. I feel Because I'm a citizen of America. It's a powerful thing to be a citizen of this nation. It's a great nation. But imagine being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven. Hey Amen. Everything the Father has is yours. The rescue is yours. The angels ministering to you. The provision coming down. The portal where you live, God putting things down inside your life. It, it's, a, it's a little things you, you weren't expecting. They just keep coming your way. Just take your hands off. Give it to God. Amen. We are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Every problem you've got introduced you to your purpose. Everything you're going through in life has a way of, of, of setting you up for good things. I uh, had an uncle once, and he used this verse. He just passed away this year. It, not a verse. He took it out of Romans 8, 28, but he, he, he put it in concise words. And I put it up for you. Every adverse circumstance, every adverse situation or circumstance must yield to me a good result every adversity that I'm going through in life, I, I'm going to force it to give me a good result. Right. Something good going to come out of this thing. Right. Amen. There's a Shetland pony in here somewhere. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So I got to keep digging through this manure. There's got to be a Shetland in here somewhere. Amen. Hallelujah. Something good going to come out. And, and the reason I, I throw these at you is these are words you live by. I've been quoting every adverse circumstance or situation must yield to me a good result for 20-something years. First time I heard it, it just rang in my spirit. Amen. It's not a verse. It's based off of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I believe that. Amen. So I'm hanging on to that, that scripture. I, I love the, and I'll start closing with a few thoughts here. Uh, got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He does the things others cannot do. I mean, that's what God does. God is enough. Everybody say he's enough. He's Come on, say it loud. You know, my, my thought was, when will God be enough? When will we understand that God is enough? When I, when I finished my message over my father, um, I have this, uh, this peace. I will see him again. My dad had a simple grace in his life. Fourteen years ago, he accepted Christ. And if grace is grace, then my dad will be in heaven. I... I he didn't have the opportunities that I've had to do the things that I've got to do. I remember when I went and traveled as an evangelist, my dad said, do you think you could make it out there? And I said, I think so, Pop. And he said, you really think that somebody's going to pay you to preach? <laughs> and he didn't mean it as a put down. He just had never had a preacher in his family. Right. You know, you can make money on moonshine, but I don't know how you're going to do it preaching. And then once, he got, uh, once my dad came and saw the things that God had done, he, he, I remember the, the, how proud he was of me. And I knew that he watched me. I, I wrote my dad a letter once. I was uh, 19 years old. I was in college, and I dropped out. And the letter, in the letter I, I said, Dad, I can't keep working, uh, partying. I wrote partying, driving a fast car, and, uh, uh, and going to college. I can't do it all, so I have to quit one. So I'm going to quit college. I actually wrote that in a letter and gave it to my dad. Within months later, I, I got born again, and I went to Bible college. And when I got a Bachelor of Theology degree, my dad and mom came to San Antonio to my graduation. 
when graduation was over, my dad walked over and put that letter in my hand. He never forgot it because in the letter it said college wasn't for me. The issue was that college wasn't for me. Amen. I had to, I had to get direction before I could go somewhere in the right place. But it was a fact that he kept that letter, and he remembered that letter, and he brought it all the way to San Antonio and hand-delivered it. There you go, boy. Amen. That was my pop. God's grace is enough. His grace is sufficient for our every frailty. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. If you need some good scriptures, write them down. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Be careful about boasting about your accolades. Be careful when you get around people tell them, I, and I'll take the preacher, for example, how big your church is, what all you do, all the things. Be careful with all that. You've got to remember that this is God's house. Amen. God's family, God's kids. You just get to be a steward over it a little while. But all of these things are important because we, we, we want to boast. We want to feel good about it. Somehow our insecurities rise up. And we want to, we want to, we're all that way. I know we are. And we want to kind of boast more about it. He said, listen, my sufficiency is in Christ. It's when I don't have that God's strong in my life. His wisdom is adequate for our every perplexity. James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. If God only gave you wisdom when you were right, you would stay stupid. <laughs> Read it again. Without finding fault, God gave you wisdom when you were in your ignorance. God gave you, because you just ask him. Why don't we ask the, the, the creator of our mind, of our spirit, of our body for wisdom? God, give me wisdom. You're in a situation right now, and if you make the wrong choice, it's going to back you up for years. It's going to hurt you financially. It's going to take away so many things out of your life. So shouldn't you ask God for wisdom? God, give me wisdom on this situation right now. I need this. I need your help here. Lead, and here's my, my, my uh, bar barometer. Lead me by peace. Whenever the storm's around me, let peace tell me that this is the right thing. I feel this is the right thing. You know, you don't go into, you, you don't want to walk into turmoil if you feel it in your spirit. But when you have peace in the middle of the storm, that's a good thing. When Jesus told the disciples to go to the other side of the lake, he meant go to the other side of the lake. Even though the storm came, it didn't matter. He told them to go. You go. And then he stands on the bow of the boat and says, peace, be still. And the water is still. Amen. And all the other little boats were calmed at the same time, according to the book of Mark. So it's important to know that, that I'm going to stick with him through this. His peace is ample for our every anxiety. Anxiety. I had a picture when some of you can remember it. It was a, a, it was a, a stork swallowing a frog. And the frog had the stork around the neck. So his head was going down in the mouth of the stork, but he had, he had the choke hold on, 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 on the bird. And it said, safe so far. Right? Sometimes that's life. Amen. It's like, uh, it looks like I'm fixing to get swallowed, but as long as I got him out of the esophagus, he ain't going to get me down in there. I'm going to stay with this thing. Uh, and here's the thing about worry. Worry will choke you to death. Worry will wrap its tentacles around your mind. It'll cause you not to sleep at night. It'll keep you awake. It, it works on you. It, it works on your digestive system. It works on your physical body. It works on your arthritis. It works on all those things. In, so, excuse me. <coughs> so worry. <coughs> and the Bible says, it's funny how God knows us. He knows our friend. How many, how many hairs can you add to your head by worrying? Jimmy? How, how many <laughs> you're, just the, you're the new kid on the block, so we're going after you. Okay. Uh, you know, how many inches can you grow by worrying? Larry was glad you're here. Uh, how many inches can you gain by worrying? None. None. And I hear people say, oh, no, well, I, I was worried about you. I, I got very few people that said they were worried about me this week, and I appreciate it. That means you're catching it. We don't worry about one another. We pray for one another. Amen. We pray you make the best in this situation, and then somehow this is all going to turn out good. You, you pray for him. So he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, and thank him for all that he has done. One of the things is, is remember what he's done for you. Thank him for that, and then tell him what you need. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. It's going to guard you. So, so talk to him. Amen. He's, he wants to give you. I, I know that God wants to give us peace. 
He doesn't want us living in anxiety. <sighs> Worry. How's it going? It's, it robs you sleep, man. It takes too much stuff from you. And uh, last point here is forgiveness is equal to our every iniquity. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Stand with me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. Uh, again, last week I admonished you to read the Beatitudes. This week I was forced to read them. I, I had to go back over them again. I had to see them and say, okay, all right, God, I understand I'm catching this. My attitude has got, got to change. God is enough. He absolutely is enough in whatever I go through in life. And, and that his blood washes me of all my sins. So I, I close with it again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. You're a citizen of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. It's a position of strength in your life. It's understanding that God's got your back. Or as Mike would say, he's got you six. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness or right things. They will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let me say, blessed is you that can hold a hammer over somebody's head and refuse to wield it, even though you've got the right. Blessed is the one that has a sword in his hand and has the power to destroy in front of you, and you've got the right, but you don't do it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the children of God. In your family, be the peacemaker. In your church, be the peacemaker. In your company, be the peacemaker. You can't get work done in chaos. You can't, uh, there's no production when people are fighting. It's going to lead to somebody saying something they shouldn't. Be the peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. No wonder the Bible calls them God's kids. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, another set of citizens. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. Say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your cha-ching reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Blessed are. I think that's the best part of it. Blessed. Even favored. Highly favored. Highly favored. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. We confess our insufficiency. God, that we're bankrupt without you. We can't breathe without you. Walk, talk, work. Without you, with nothing. So tomorrow as we enter the workplace, our schools, our homes, the thing that you may have us, our retirement, whatever it is that you have us do, remind us, God, how much we need you. And Lord, I thank you for the fact that we're only visiting these, this planet, that we're simply ambassadors. You could call us a citizen of America, Texas, but the big deal is the citizenship of the kingdom of God. We think different, we walk different, we talk different because we're from another land. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless the ambassadors. Amen. Amen. God bless you on HolyWild.com. Tell somebody about it. And if you can, come be with us in church. Amen. Guys, 7 o'clock Sunday night, we'll be meeting in New Caney. So it won't be a success without.